Hello guys and gals, and this is part three of our reading of J.R.R. Tolkien's Smith of Wooten Major. And I will probably finish this story today. The second story, um, Farmer G Giles of Ham, is about a hundred pages or so, so it's going to take a while. But I think that we can probably finish this one off, but maybe not. There are some pictures in here and stuff like that. Okay, in the last episode, um, Smith, who is the blacksmith, Smith Smithson, um, met the queen of the fairy queen, actually. And now, um, Alf, the apprentice, who apparently has magical power since he doesn't, he doesn't age, it doesn't seem like, um, is wanting the star back from Smith. And we're going to see if Smith gives back the star. But first, we're going to go over the copyright information, which I believe... Right here. As it says, um, the book, the, the story we're reading is um, copyright 1967. All rights reserved. Published in the United States. And that's what we're going for. All rights reserved. Meaning that if there is copyright issues of any sort, just let me know and I'll take the video down. Anyways, we are going to continue. Yeah, get the bookmark out of there. And also, Smith learned more about his grandfather. Because it was his grandfather that had the star before he did. Okay, so yeah, the um, Prentice is going to make another cake and wants to put the star in it. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Very well, you shall have it, said the smith. He looked at Alf as if he were trying to read his thoughts. Do you know where, where, do you know who will find it? What is that to you, Master Smith? I should like to know if you do, Master Cook. It might be easier for me to part with, with a thing so dear to me. My daughter's child is too young. Um, it might, it might, and it might not. We shall see, said Alf. They said no more, and they went on their way until they passed out of ferry and came back at last to the village. There they walked to the hall, and in the and in the world the sun was now setting, and a red light was in the shadows. The gilded carvings on the great door glowed, and strange faces of many colors looked down. From the water spouts under under the roof. Oh, it had those cool water spout things. Cool. Um, water spouts. Are, okay, under the roof. Not long ago, the the hall had been reglazed and repainted, and there had been much debate on the count on the council about it. Some disliked it and called it newfangled, but some were more with more knowledge knew that it was a return to old custom. Still, since it was since it had cost no one a penny, and the master cook must have paid for it himself, he was allowed to have his way, his own way. But the smith had not seen seen it in such a light before, and he stood and looked at the hall in wonder, forgetting his errand. He felt a touch on his arm, and Alf led him round to a small door at the back. He opened it and led the smith down a dark passage into into the storeroom. He had lit a tall candle and unlocked the cupboard and took down from the shelf the black box. It was polished now and adorned with silver scroll with silver scrolls. He raised the lid and showed it to the smith. Oh, that's 48. Pages do tend to stick together. This book hasn't been opened in a while. Uh, oh, that's still 48. Ah. There. Okay, I think I got it. I think I got it. I think I got it. Okay. 46. Here we go. One small compartment was empty. The others were now filled with spices, fresh and pungent. And the smith's eyes began to water. He put his hand on his forehead, and the star came away readily. But he felt a sudden stab of pain, and tears ran down his face. Though the star shone brightly again as he lay his hand lay, oh, as it lay in, uh, in his hand. He couldn't he could not see it except as a blurred dazzle of light that seemed far away. 
I cannot see clearly, he said. You must put, put it in for me. He held out his hand, and Alf took the star and laid it in its place, and it went dark. The smith turned away without another word and groped his way to the door. On the threshold, he found that his sight had cleared again. It was evening, and the even star was shining in a luminous sky close to the moon. As he stood for a moment looking at their beauty, he felt a hand on his shoulder and turned. You gave me the star freely, said Alf. If you still wish to know to which child it will go, I will tell you. I do indeed. It shall go to any one that you appoint. The smith was taken aback and did not answer at once. Well, he said hesitantly, I wonder what you may think of my choice. I believe you have little reason to love the name of Noakes. But, well, his little grand, great-grandson, Noakes of Townsend's Tem, is coming to the feast. Noakes of Townsend is quite different. I have, I've observed that, said Alf. He is, he had a wise mother. Yes, my Nell's sister, but apart from the, the kinship, I love little Tem. Though he's not an obvious choice. Alf smiled. Neither, neither were you, he said. But I agree. Indeed, I have already chosen Tim. Then why did you ask me to choose? The queen wished me to do so. If you had chosen differently, I should have given. I should have given way. The smith looked uh, looked long at Alf. Then suddenly he bowed low. I understand at last, sir. He said, "You have done us too much honor." I have been repaid, said Alf. Go home now in peace. When the smith reached his own house on the western outskirts of the village, he found his son at by the door of the forge. He had just locked it, for the day's work was done, and now he stood looking up the white road by which his father used to return from his journeys. Hearing footsteps, he turned in surprise to see him coming from the village, and he ran forward to meet him. He put his arms around him in loving welcome. I've been hoping for you since yesterday, Dad, he said, then looked into his father's face. He said, 48, okay. Anxiously, how tired you look. You must have walked far, maybe. Very far indeed, my son, all the way from daybreak to evening. They went into the house together, and it was dark except for the fire flickering on the hearth. His son lit candles, and for a while they sat by the fire without speaking, for a great weariness and bereavement was on the smith. At last he looked around, as if coming to himself, and said, Why are we alone? His son looked at, looked hard at him. Why? Mother, mother's over at Minor, at Nan's. It's the little lad's second birthday. They hoped you would be there, too. Ah, yes, I ought to have been, I said. Uh, oh, I, I should have. I should have been, Ned. But I was delayed, and I have had matters to think to think of that put all else out of my mind for a time. But I did not forget. Tomling. He put his hand on his breast and drew out a little wallet of soft leather. I have brought him something, a trinket, old Noakes might, maybe would call it, but it comes from the fair, from the fairy, Ned. Out of the wallet, he took a little thing of silver. It was like a smooth stem of a tiny lily, from the top of which came three delicate flowers, bending down like shapely bells. And the bells, they were, for when you shook them gently, each flower rang with a small, clear note. At the sweet sound, the candles flickered, and then, for a moment, shone with a white light. Ned's eyes went wide with wonder. May I look at it, Dad? he said. He took it with careful fingers and peered into the flowers. The work is, is a marvel, he said. And, Dad, there's a scent in the bells, a scent that reminds me of, reminds me, well, of something I've forgotten. Yes, the scent comes... For a little while after the bells have rung, but don't fear, don't fear to handle it, Ned. It was made for a babe to play with. 
he can do it no harm, and he'll take none from it. Smith put the gift back in the wallet and stowed it away. I'll take it over to Wooten Minor myself tomorrow, he said. Nan and her Tom and mother will forgive me, maybe. As for Tomling, his time has not yet come for the counting of days and of weeks and of months and of years. That's right, you go. That's right, you go. Dad, I'd be glad to go with you, but it would be some time before I can get over to Minor. I couldn't have gone today even if I hadn't waited here for you. There's a lot of work in hand and more coming in. No, no, Smith's son. Make it a holiday. The name, uh, the name of grandfather hasn't weakened my arms yet a while. Let the work come. There will be two pairs of hands to tackle it now. All working days. I shall... Um, wait. Making sure that I keep these in sequence. Not be going on a journey again. Ned, not long... Oh, I, I won't be going on a journey again, Ned. Not on long ones, if you understand me. It's, it's that way, is it, Dad? I wondered what had become of the star. That's hard. He took his father's hand. I'm grieving for you, but there's good in it, too. For this house, do you know Mr. Smith? Oh, Master Smith. Not Mr. Smith. Master Smith. There is much you can teach me yet, if you have the time. And I do not mean only the working of iron. They had supper together, and long after they had finished, they still sat at the table while the smith told his son of his last journey to ferry, and of other things that came to his mind, but about the choices, but about the choice of the next holder of the star... He said nothing. At last his son looked at him, and, Father, he said, do you remember the day when you came back with the flower, and I said that you looked like a giant by your shadow? The shadow was the truth, so it was the queen herself that, that you danced with. Yet you have given up the star. I hope it may go to someone as worthy. The child should be grateful. The child won't know, said the smith. That's the way that's the way with such gifts. Well, there it is. I have handed it on and come back to hammer and tongs. It is a strange thing, but old Noakes, who had scoffed at his apprentice, had never been able to put one put out of his mind the disappearance of the star in the cake. Although the event had happened so many years ago, he had grown fat and lazy and retired from his office when he was sixty. No great age, no great age in the village. He was now near the end of his of his eighties and was of enormous bulk, for he still ate heartily and doted on sugar. Most of his days were not at the table. He spent in a big chair by the window of his cottage or by the door if it was fine weather. He liked talking, since he still had many opinions to air, but lately he talked mostly, oh, but, but his talk mostly turned of the one great cake that he had made. And he was now firmly convinced, for whenever he fell asleep, it came into his dreams. Prentice <coughs> sometimes stopped for a word or two, so the old cook still called him, and he explained, expected himself to be called master. That Prentice <coughs> excuse me, was careful to do, which was a point in his favor, though there were others that Noakes were more fond of. One afternoon, Noakes was nodding in his chair by the door after his dinner. He woke with a start to find Prentice standing by and looking down at him. Hello, he said. I'm glad to see you, for that cake's been on my mind again. I was thinking of it just now, in fact. It was the best cake I ever made, and na that's saying something. But perhaps you have forgotten it. No, Master, I remember it very well. But, but what? 51. Yeah. Oh, page is sticking together. There. This, is, this should be it. Ah, 52, here we go. 
what is troubling you? It was a good cake, and it was enjoyed as pl and praised. Of course I made it, but that doesn't trouble me. It's the little trinket, the star. I cannot make up my mind what became of it. Of course it wouldn't, of course it wouldn't melt. I only said that to stop the children from being frightened. I, I have wondered if one of them did, did not swallow it, but is that likely? You might swallow one of those little coins and not notice it, but not that star. It was small, but it had sharp points. Yes, master, but do you really know what the star was made of? Don't trouble your mind about it. Someone, someone swallowed it, I assure you. Then who? Well, I've a long memory, and that day sticks in it somehow. I can recall all the children's names. Let me think. It must have been Miller's Molly. She was greedy and bolted her food. She's as fat as a sack now. Yes, there are some folk who get like that, Master, but Molly did not bolt, bolt her cake. She found two trinkets in her slice. Oh, did she? Well, it was Cooper's Harry then, a barrel of a boy with a big mouth like a frog's. I should have said, Master, that he, he was a nice boy with a large friendly grin. Anyway, he was so careful that he took his slice to pieces before he ate it. He found nothing but cake. Then it must have been that little pale girl, Draper's Lily. She used to swallow pens as a baby and came to no harm. No, no, not Lily, Master. She only ate the paste and the sugar and gave the inside to the boy that, that sat next to her. Then I give up. Who was it? You seem to have been watching very closely, if you're not making it all up. It was the Smith's son, Master, and I think... A good, it was good for him. Go on, laughed, the no, laughed old Noakes. I ought to have known you were having a game with me. Don't be ridiculous. Smith was a quiet, slow boy then. He makes more noise now. A bit of a songster, I hear. But he's cautious. No risk for him. Chews twice before he swallows, and always did. If you take my meaning. I do, Master. Well, if you won't believe me, it was Smith. I can't help you. Uh, I can't help you. Perhaps it doesn't matter much now. Will it ease your mind if I tell you that the star is back in the box now? Here it is. Prentice was wearing a dark green cloak, which Noakes now noticed for the first time. From its folds, he produced a black box and opened it under the old cook's nose. There is the star, master, down in the corner. Old Noakes began coughing and sneezing, but at last he looked into the box. So it is, he said. At least it looks like it. It is the same one, Master. I put it there myself a few days ago. I will go back. In, it will go back in the great cake this, win, this winter. Aha! Said Noakes, leering at Prentice, and then he laughed till he looked. He sh shook like like a jelly. I see, I see, 24 children and 24 lucky bits, and the star was one, was one extra. So you nipped it out before the baking and kept it for another time. You were always a tricky fellow, nimble one might, nimble one might say, and thrifty, wouldn't waste a bee's knee of butter. Ha, ha, ha. So, that was the way of it. I might have guessed, well, that clears up, that, that's cleared up now. I can have a I can have a nap in peace. He settled down in his chair. Mind that Prentice man of your of yours plays plays you no tricks. The the artful don't know all the arts. They say he closed his eyes. Goodbye, master," said Prentice, shutting the box with such a snap that the cook opened his eyes again. Noakes," he said, "your knowledge is so great that I have only twice ventured to tell you anything. I told you that the star came from fairy." And I also told you that it went to the smith. You laughed at me. Now, at parting, I will tell you one thing more. Don't laugh again. You are a vain old old fraud, fat, idle, and, and sly. I did most of your work without thanks and learned all that... And thanks. You learned all you could from me except respect for fairy and a little courtesy. You have not e even enough to bid me good day. 
If it comes to courtesy, said Noakes, I see none in calling you, calling your elders and betters by ill names. Take your ferry and your nonsense somewhere else. Good day to you, if that's what you are waiting for. Now, go along with you, he flapped his hand mockingly. If, you're, if you've got one of your fairy friends hidden in the kitchen, send him to me and I'll have a look at him. If he waves his little wand and makes me thin again, I'll think better of him, he laughed. Would you spare a few moments for the king of fairy? The other, ans the, the other answered. To Noak's dismay, he grew taller as he spoke. He threw out his cloak. He was dressed like a master cook at a at a feast, but his white garments shimmered and, gl and glinted, and on his forehead was a great jewel, like a radiant star. His face was young but stern. Old man, he said, you are at least not my elder. As to my better, you have often sneered at me behind my back. Do you challenge me now, openly? He stepped forward, and Noakes shrank from him, trembling. He tried to, to shout for help, but found that he could hardly whisper. No, sir, he croaked. Don't do me a harm. I am only a poor old man. The king's face so softened. Alas, yes, you speak the truth. Do not be afraid. Be at ease. But will you not expect the king of fairy to do something? Wait, let me make sure. Let's see, five. Go. Yeah, here we go. For you before he leaves you, I grant you your wish. Farewell, now go to sleep. He wrapped his cloak around him again and went away towards the hall. But before he was out of sight, the old cook's googling eyes had shut and he was snoring. When the old cook woke up again, the sun was going down. He rubbed his eyes and shivered a little, for the autumn air was chilling. Ugh, what a dream, he said. I must have. It must have been that pork at dinner. From that... From that day, he became so afraid of having more bad dreams that uh, of that sort that he hardly dared eat anything for fear that it might upset him, and his meals became very short and plain. He soon became lean, and his clothes and his skin hung on him in folds and creases. The children called him Old Ragon Bones. Then, for a time, he found that he could get about the village again and walk with no more help than a stick. And he lived many years longer than he would otherwise have done. Indeed, it is said that he, that he just made his century, the only memorable thing he ever achieved. But, but till his last year, he could be heard saying to any that would listen to, to his tale, alarming, you might call it, but a silly dream. When, when you come to think of it, King O'Ferry, well... Why he hadn't? Why he hadn't no wand? And if you stop eating, you grew thinner. The that nat, that that's natural. Sounds to reason. That ain't no magic in it. The time for the twenty-four feasts came round. Smith was there. Was there to sing songs and his wife to help with the children. Smith looked at them as they sang and danced, and he thought that they were more beautiful and lively than they had been in his boyhood. For a moment, he crossed his mind, oh, it crossed his mind to wonder what Alf might have been doing in his spare time. Any one of them seemed fit to find the, find the star, but his eyes were mostly on Tim, or rather, a rather plump boy, plump little boy, clumsy in the dances, but with a sweet voice in, in the singing. At table, he sat silent, watching the sharpening of the knife and the cutting of the cake. Suddenly, he piped up, Dear Mr. Cook, only cut me a small piece, please. I've eaten so much already. I feel rather full. All right, Tim, said Alf. I'll cut you a special slice. I think you'll find it, go it goes down easy. Smith watched as Tim ate his cake slowly, but with e evident pleasure though when he found no trinket or coin in it, he looked disappointed. But soon a light began to shine in his eyes, and he laughed and became merry, the, and sang softly to himself. Then he got up and began to dance all alone with an odd grace that he had never shown before. The children all laughed and clapped. I think this is the, yeah, this is the last page. 
All is well, then, thought Smith. So you are my heir. I wonder what strange places the star will lead you to. Poor old Noakes, still, I suppose he will never know what a shocking thing has happened in his family. He never did, but one thing happened at that feast that pleased him mightily. Before it was over, the master cook took leave of the children and of all the others that were present. I'll say goodbye now, he said. In a day or two, I shall be going away. Master Harper is quite ready to take over. He is a very good cook, and as you know, he comes from your very own village. I shall go back home. I do not think you will miss me. The children said goodbye cheerfully and thanked the cook, thanked the cook prettily for, the, for his beautiful cake. Only little Tim took his hand and said quietly, I'm sorry. In the village, there were, in fact, several families that, that did miss Alf for some time. A few of his friends, especially Smith and Harper, grieved at his going, and they kept the hall gilded and painted in memory of Alf. Most people, however, were content. They had, they had had him for a long time, oh, for a very long time, rather, and were not sorry to have a change. But old Noakes thumped his stick on the floor and said roundly, He's gone at last, and I'm glad for one. I never liked him. He was too artful, too nimble, you might say. And that's how it ended. Because now, in the next episode, we will be reading Farmer Giles of Ham. And I think it's about a dragon, so that's going to be kind of cool. I believe this is draconic, but I can't read it. I'm sorry. I, I don't think that I can read this. But it has a... Um, we will read the um, cover page here. Farmer G Giles of Ham. And I'm going to read the translation. Or in our vulgar tongue, The Rise and Wonderful Adventures of Farmer Giles, Lord of Tame, Count of Wormingham and King of the Little Kingdom. And that's what we're going to leave it at. This has been part three of our reading of Smith of Wooten Major. And um, the next video will be our reading of Farmer Giles of Ham Part 1. We're going to do it like that. I could go to Part 4 of the short story series, but... I think that that's, that's going to be confusing, considering that we're going to be reading Farmer Giles of Ham for a few days. A few um, episodes. Anyways, um, this is the cover art is by the Brothers Hildebrand. And um, I really like the art here. It's, it's amazing. And it is from the story that we'll be reading next, Farmer Giles of Ham. Anyways, if you like this content, oh, well, actually we've been reading Smith of Wooten Major by J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, but yeah, anyways, if you like this content, make sure you like and subscribe and ring the bell so you know when I upload, and if you want to support me in any way, all that information will be in the description below. As always, thanks for watching everyone, and have a great day.